Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. And first of all, it's a great honor for me to present the talk and participate in Inner Source Commons along the side, Gail, because um, it's super exciting for all of us. So we're going to discuss all about how did we get started with Inner Source and how has been our journey so far. And also we'll share our own insights with the community. So without any further ado, I just wanted to introduce a little bit about our team. Uh, you must be already knowing, um, pretty much we have given a lot of talks in the past years also. So we are a five person globally distributed team and we located in all over USA as well as Chennai, India. And uh, we support, I would say approximately 9,000 technologists across our organization. And uh, we have Sheila, we report to Sheila, she's in our uh, meeting today. And she leads OSPO at Comcast, and she's from Silver Spring, Maryland. And we have Chan Wong. She basically takes care of all of our upstream work, primarily that is being uh, handled by Chan Wong from um, Denver. Uh, she lives in Colorado, Denver. And we have our lead engineer from India, Chennai. Her name is Rama Devi, and she pretty much takes care of all the development sort of a work for our OSPO. And I'm super excited to uh, introduce Gail as well. We have uh, Gail in our call today. And I'm so happy to share this virtual stage of ISC community call with Gail. And that's um, super exciting for me today. And Gail is prim primarily focusing on all the compliances, licenses, and all of the downstream work that we do in here. And as you know me, and um, I'm also from uh, as part of the OSPO at Comcast. Uh, I'm I would say like it's been almost close to two years for me with this group. And I'm a technical program manager, uh, works with the Comcast Open Source Program Office in here, and I heavily focus on the downstream co contributions as like Gail. Also, I do uh, support on the all the things that are happening in and around open and inner source communities. So that's about me and thanks for having me here. We can go on to the next slide. Thank you, Adi. So um, before we kind of share our insights with Inner Source, we just would like to give you a little bit of our journey with open source. Because um, each organization, they run their models in a different way. What has worked for us might not be working for others, but we all have a standard guidelines or a standard structure that we generally follow. We would like to just uh, share a couple of minutes of our open source journey at Comcast. So uh, we may not be able to read all of the things that are there on the slide, but we will just make a shout out on the ears where we kind of see a pretty much uh, good amount of um, a growth or initiations that has happened in the past. And I would definitely say most of these um, items that you see on the screen uh, might have happened before my time at Comcast. So I would say one of the big things that we need to start with is 2006. Don't worry about it. It's not there on the screen, but still. That's when we found out that we knew we were the users of open source, and we also knew that we were been using open source more uh, than way before that we used to think. So um, the people who are working for OSPO at our organization, we started uh, taking a poll, and we did a lot of service internally. And also we did uh, talk to people who have been there with Comcast so much longer than we have. So we have come out that we're going to do the open sourcing from the year of 2006. So that's when it started and there is no turn back. And also our very first contribution that was happened in 2010. And also the most important aspect of open source advisory council, which we formed in 2013. It's an important group for all of us, and you might already know about similar sort of groups that run in other organizations. But we just want to give you a little bit about our open source advisory council group in here. So that uh, open source advisory council group consists of folks from different areas like security, legal, and we have some senior engineers, and we do have some respectable engineers across the organization. So 
Uh, the OSPO is coordinating, or I would say all the folks along with OSPO, we partner together to open source the code with our developers. So pretty much we opened our door in 2017 and the company has taken a huge investment, I would say. So when the OSPO has been kind of born at our organization, the OSPOs weren't that popular and we were uh, kind of getting to know about them. And, uh, you know, we have this OSPO group and we started hearing about other OSPOs like many other MNCs, like Google has an OSPO, Facebook has an OSPO, Meta has an OSPO, and other bank and government agencies, they run their own OSPOs. So ours is created in 2017. And now fast forward to over 2023 and 2024, we have around, I would say, 200 open source projects. And we also have open source ambassadors across, uh, I would say, all over the world. So that's an incredible way of seeing the progress with our open source journey. And definitely, without any doubt, we would like to continue our contributions as we move forward with 2024 and as we step into 2025 as well. So that's about our open source journey. With that being said, we can check out our inner source journey in our next slide. Thank you, Adi. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit background about our inner source journey here before we try to touch upon on the milestones. In the beginning, uh, we had some of the objections to opening the repos. So when we started spreading the word of inner source across the company, um, there were a number of people who had objections. So we would say, can you open up your repo to others and uh, other teams to contribute to your project? Or... Uh, can you help them to use your project more efficiently? Then immediately people would say, I cannot open this repo because I have secret passcodes or elements that I cannot open. So we used to hear some sort of objections every now and then. And um, we do also say that maybe people might have created their code in a hurry and they might have not followed the guidelines or they might have not um be very open uh, to just share with other teams so people sometimes they would come and say to us saying that they didn't want to see um the code or review the code by other teams who are not really aware of it so there are some sort of objections that we tend to hear when we started our journey in our organization but so we, what we have done is as a solution to all of those objections that we have received, um, we kind of work through the process and we try to educate the people on all of uh, the benefits that we have over the objections that they are coming up with. So we truly believe that education is an important aspect of all of this process all along. And um, for example, we have done our annual trainings with all of our developers and we provide office hours and we do also do a lot of consultations in how to set up their inner source projects for success. And um, also, as, as uh, I was mentioning, we might be um, you know, getting too many questions from so many sources. So we use number of other communications tools to stay in touch with our developers, such as Slack, Teams, webinars, and some other conferences or internal lunch and learn sessions. So we have kind of used many communication tools to um, you know, amplify the information across the organization. So we would confidently say that education is something that we do throughout the year. And we still continue the same in our OSPOs. So in a nutshell, to just give you a highlight, on 20, 2017, we launched the Inner Source Pilot. And 2020, we continued our marketing advocating of the Inner Source, uh, um, you know, the projects across organization. And 2022, we are super excited here. So we joined our ISC as sponsors. And from there onwards until now, we have 60 plus successful projects. That's about our inner source journey. Yeah, let's actually talk a little bit about the main intention or the goal in setting up the governance structure of inner source in our organization. So it's basically to ensure that 
we have a defined process that basically helps all the participants who are interested in doing the inner source programs uh, within the organization. So uh, there is another point that has come to our mind saying that we cannot determine all of this at one go or all by ourselves. So we need to expand our mindset and we need to collaborate with other teams. So that is when we started building or we started creating these governance models. In our opinion, we truly, truly believe that inner source is always a transformation or kind of a culture change um, we would uh, definitely say that the acceptance should definitely com come from the leadership and also it's, uh, on the part of uh, developers, they should take their own steps. And also it does take time. It is not just like one meeting or one week or one month uh, education. It does definitely take time to build that um, you know trust and to just work together with different multiple teams within the organizations and collaboration on all of these projects is really elevating that software development culture. So uh, we would uh, highly and strongly believe that it's a special skill. So inner source is kind of a skill that everybody should think as it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's like a community initiative and where the mentorship plays a big role, a very, very big role. So that's, the OSPO is sort of doing in many of the organizations, but in a nutshell, in our large organizations, um, the departments can definitely go siloed and unaware of all of the projects that the other teams are doing. So we as an OSPO acts like the central hub for all of the information, for promoting, for sharing all of the projects across the entire organization. So thereby, we can definitely see the increase in the visibility and also increase in the individual projects, um, uh, the visibility to uh, all the other members. So that's a glimpse of our governance. And with that being said, I would like to hand it over to Gail to talk more about the project setups, different factors that we consider for inner and open sources. And she would also take your journey on how um, it will be taken a path moving to inner to open sources. Thank you. And over to you, Gail. Thank you, Anu. Um, I just want to say, uh, give Anu a special shout out and thank you again. This is her first external talk while working at Comcast. And I'm very proud of her and very um, excited to share this virtual stage with her today. So thank you, Anu, uh, for being brave and taking a big step today. So I appreciate that. Um, as Anu said, we're a globally distributed team. Um, and we, as an OSPO, we're the centralized home for open source and inner source. Um, and we made that choice uh, modeling after other companies to kind of keep it consolidated into one place and have a team of experts who can do all of that work together. Um, so what I, this is the primary slide I'm going to be sharing today. And I'm going to really deep dive into the prepare and strategy sections because what we wanted to share today is what the process looks like for us to work directly with teams to make their project inner source at Comcast. And the reason it needs a process is because there um, are, if we find if people don't know that something is inner source, they don't know they can use it. They have to know it's there. And we also want to ensure that there are um, practices in place to keep the project secure and protect Comcast IP. And we'll deep dive into those. So to start with, um, the first thing we do is an assessment to determine fit. And on our, we have an internal website for our OSPO where we have all of this documented. So if a team has, an interest in inner sourcing their project, um, we have a self-assessment they can do to determine if their project is a fit. And so the first question that we ask is, can other teams benefit from using the project? Second is, do you have teams identified downstream that can benefit from this project? And it may not be a hard requirement, but something you should ask yourself, um, am I inner sourcing it for the sake of it, or is this actually beneficial to others? Do you have leadership support is the third question. And that's truly just to ensure that we can help you be successful and that um, there aren't conflicting priorities that might pull you away from this work. And we want you to help have the project be successful and help set you up for that. Uh, the fourth question is, is it using continuous integration tools? Um, do you have some sort of CI CD that you're integrating with? And fifth, does the project already live in GitHub? And that's our 
those are just the basic five questions that we provide our teams for that assessment to determine if they should spend the time um, diving into inner source. And one thing I should note is that at Comcast, our repos are um, moving into a default state of private um, and private being just viewable by that team that's working on the project directly. And so with our inner source process, we do these checks because then we know we're going to make that repo visible to all internal employees or internal users. So our first step is the assessment to determine fit. Our next stage is the preparation stage. So the first thing we have um, our team members do is send a ticket to our OSPO. We have an ad hoc ticketing system um, that we has a we built a template out for inner source criteria and workflow, but you can use GitHub, Jira, ServiceNow, an email, um, a Google form, whatever is available to your team. Some way for to centralize those requests, to have an intake process. Um, we want to be able to track how many requests we get for inner source intersourcing per year to help us ensure we have that business case. And so we can have metrics and data around how well the program's doing and how much usage there is, which a lot of our, um, our companies like when we're in OSPOs. In the preparation process, um, we schedule a consult and that can be something the team schedules or we schedule it. Generally, we end up scheduling it because we are a lot of program managers and we're working primarily with technical talent who may have less comfort with that. And so we schedule a consult, one of us does, and in that consult process, one of our team members will meet with the engineering team, whoever owns the project they want to inner source. And we basically go through the talk that I'm giving you right now. We give the talk that we're giving you today. This is the slide deck that we use for our consultations to go through, this is what it looks like and this is what you're going to do. In that consultation, we talk about the other setup steps. Um, part of that is making sure your repo has a readme that has the project overview and project benefits. Um, we also ensure in that repo setup is that you have a security assessment completed. We, um, the reason for that, besides just general security, is we want to ensure any data there is free of PII, or, um, personal identifiable information, or company secrets, um, and also check for vulnerabilities. There are many good reasons to have good security practices. One of our drivers is that the code you're creating could be used by someone else in the team. So we want to ensure that we have secure code passing between teams that doesn't have any containing PII or secrets. And secondly, if there's an intention or interest in one day open sourcing the work, we want to ensure that th that work is done up front so that when you're ready to open source, all of that is has been tidied up and handled. Others, um, Tasks included in the preparation stage are adding the about description to the repo and also creating all of your collaboration files. So having a contributing file, a developer file, a code owner's file, um, and the content created in those. We have templates for those all hosted on our website. I'm not able to share those today, um, but it's something that there are examples we pulled from out in the industry to have something ready for um, anyone on our team so that we can create consistency in how our forms and how all other source projects are looking. That way it's easy to interact and engage with those. That's our stage two, where we have a bulk of the um, kind of admin preparation work for intersourcing a project. And at that point we've already said, yes, it's a fit, let's keep going. It hasn't been necessarily approved yet, but we know we want to continue in the process because approval comes in stage four. Our third phase is the strategy. And specifically, that's more of the community strategy. We work with our teams, we provide them with templates and examples of other strategies. And what we want from them, from the teams that tend to intersource a project, is a plan for how they're going to enable successful um, engagement in their project. So some of these criteria are one, have a low barrier to entry. How are um, other teams able to find your repo and then quickly see, are they able to read instructions for how to use it? Um, are, are there instructions for commenting? Um, we want it to be easy for other teams to engage. The second, is to create templates for both issues and pull requests. Um, that being there so that, again, consistency and making it easy for teams to engage with your work. Um, 
We also want to have a backlog or to-do list of things that you will be adding and have that be shared publicly somewhere that's accessible to all of the users. And then the last item in the strategy section or strategy stage is specifically around identifying your, the roles of your community for your project. Have you identified your user base? Who are your users? What do they need your project for? Um, how will they engage with it? And who are they? Um, a profile for your trusted committers, maintainer, product owners, and of course, mentorship. How, what is your plan for, and how, what is your written down documented plan um, and a description of the role of mentorship and what it looks like for your project and how you will sustain that. Um, so we went through that kind of quickly in about five minutes, um, but the majority of the actual work of consulting with the team is working with them on the preparation stage where we're creating files and doing all the documentation to make the project ready to be intersourced. And second, having a strategy for the how. How can people engage? How are they going to hear about it? How are we going to communicate um, and market? And what are the plans for all of that? So that covers our strategy stages, determine fit, prepare, and strategy. So the first three phases of our intersource consultation process. Um, a proven release is pretty straightforward. It's we have our team or architects we work with say, yes, okay, all your checks have been completed. Um, we usually partner with senior technical talent to do that work, someone in our ambassador program to help us with the assessment to ensure that everything is completed, security consultant, security assessments been completed. Everything is, is good, it's safe to release. It's And then it's just flipped to public, which our team coordinates with our GitHub um, owners to ensure that happens. The fifth and final stage, this is where um, you'll see the project succeed or not, depending on how wh what your strategy and preparation and work have looked like. And that is the fifth stage of being promote and maintain. In this stage, it's continuous documentation as things change, as your project grows, features are added, um, have, making sure we have all of that we don't get stale, which all of you are familiar with if you're in, we don't want stale content. Um, second, evangelizing, um, which is promote. We want, so going to team meetings, doing road shows, asking for a slot on your department's all staff, asking other teams if you can come to their team meeting and do a presentation. It's, and we will help our engineers if they need help with that presentation, if they need help with finding out who those people are and getting scheduled and set up. That's all part of the dev role or developer relations work that we do. We also encourage teams to use incentives um, to promote their project. So that includes swag, stickers, uh, repo badges, thank you emails, thank you call outs in Slack, um, thank you posts and whatever your internal company's um, platforms are. It's really about calling, letting people know that you appreciate their contributions and giving them a reason to wanna come back. Um, Another practice we have for this is we, we tell teams when you want to promote your project, make sure you approve pull requests quickly. So if someone's putting in a pull request for your project, have alerts, something so that you can show those users that you are watching, you are engaged and invested. I think that's important or we think it's important for our communities to see that. Um, the other two items that we, um, recommend, we talk about for promoting and maintaining our team, uh, we presented last year at Intersource Summit, our Intersource dashboard built on Backstage. So that's a marketplace where teams can browse Intersource projects. And also you can look at your project, look at your um, user metrics, your commits, um, get your data so you can tell your story about your project. And again, if our teams need help with that, someone on our team will help them refine their pitch. We, we handhold throughout the process, um, of this, these first five phases and will help you if your project is starting to get stale and you want help evangelizing and building momentum again, we can help you with a plan for that. And the final thing to remember is that no one size fits all. Try things out and see what works with your community. Um, we recommend just always be open to try new things and don't be afraid of failing. If something doesn't work, try something new, ask for help, reach out. Um, and that's what our consultation process looks like and what it is like for us to fully bring someone into InnerSource and release it out into the, into the company. I also wanted to touch on 
this is something we share with our teams and our leaders and our non kind of open source users to say, this is a difference. This is why inner source versus open source. So if people come to us um, not knowing the difference or how they want to approach it, this is some of the, um, the items that we share with them to explain the difference. A big difference being that once it's open sourced, um, we're going to make sure there's a license enabled or added to the repo and additional security checks. And there's just more to do before it goes out into the world. Um, and this is just something we, again, we use this deck when we're actually doing a consultation. So it's helpful to have this as part of our content. And then lastly, sometimes our projects um, see inner source as a stepping stone to open source. It may be inner source for life, or it might be a stepping stone to open source. And this is the criteria. It's the same five phases, but different steps um, that are involved in that. And so that is our talk um, today. We wanted to thank uh, Inner Source Commons for hosting us. This has been a pleasure being here. And we wanted to open up um, to any questions that anyone has about consultations, onboarding, and getting the Inner Source um, nitty gritty details working in your company.